Yeah, well, good morning. Good. good morning and welcome to um, part three with uh, Dr. Fred Provenza. If you check out our YouTube channel, uh, Manitoba Grazing Clubs, you'll notice we've done two already over the past couple of weeks. So today is uh, part three. Um, Dr. Provenza is Professor Emeritus, Department of Wildland Resources, Utah State University. Uh, my name is Michael Teeley. I'm Grazing Club Coordinator, and we're planning to do a number of webinars over the course of the winter. So today, part three is let food be thy medicine. And with that, we'll, uh, we'll get started. Well, thank you, Michael. Good to be with you again uh, this yep. week. And uh, we, uh, we said that this, the broad topic would be this notion of how pallets link animals, including us, with landscapes. And uh, we started out talking about the only constant, uh, which is change, and, and trying to use that to set, a, set the stage for everything that we would talk about. Um, we then went last week into a fairly long session, actually, titled Let Feed Be Thy Medicine. And we want to springboard off of that uh, for this session today on Let Food Be Thy Medicine. And uh, just briefly, what we talked about last week, we, we started out by pointing out nobody has to tell a wild animal how to eat or what to eat or how to develop and replicate and so forth. They, they know how to do that. That is to say, in a way, they're locally adapted both at the level of the genome and the epigenome and the learned behaviors to the environments that they inhabit. And we pointed out that even laboratory rats are very clever in terms of their food selection and nutrition when they're made deficient in particular nutrients or put in states of diabetic states they behave in appropriate ways to rectify the malady. Um, we went on to point out that from the standpoint of herbivores, they face a lot of challenges in attempting to forage. Um, some plants are nutritious, some are toxic, depending upon the time of the day or the season and so forth, they can be too nutritious or toxic. And then we pointed out, and we're gonna build on this today from a human standpoint, resources available in the environment where the plant's growing influences the chemistry of the plant. And uh, we talked some about that and we said that plants respond biochemically. Um, that is to say they're changing their concentrations of these primary compounds, energy, protein, minerals, and so forth but also these secondary compounds, these tens of thousands of compounds that come under categories such as terpenes, alkaloids, phenolics, and so forth. Um, plants are, are using these compounds to interface with the environment. Uh, so plants respond biochemically to sunlight, moisture, nutrients, other plants that are growing around them, and then to uh, use by herbivores. And then we pointed out that herbivores respond to the chemical characteristics of the plants. And we're gonna build on this from a human standpoint today. Um, and then we pointed out, and we, we spent really the, the, the whole time talking about how herbivores are able to do that. When they're locally adapted to the environments they inhabit, they don't need nutritionists, pharmacists, or veterinarians. Uh, if they've got a wide array of foods available to them, um, the landscape is the nutrition center, it is the pharmacy, and the animals themselves become their own veterinarians. They know how to, to do what they need to do. Then we talked, uh, we said last time that we would this time talk about not only challenges humans face in foraging, but how we, how we can cope with those, which is going to be the topic for today. And we left with this question, we said, consider the irony, uh, these Wild and locally adapted domestic animals don't need any authorities to tell them what, what not to do, but we do. Uh, and then we raised the question, you know, is it that we lack nutritional wisdom or has that ability been hijacked? And we said, suggested that that's been hijacked. And so today let's talk about um, those topics from a human standpoint uh, with this idea of let food be our medicine. And as we did last time, made the point that the availability of alternative foods, and last week we were talking about plants and plant diversity and these landscapes with diverse array of plants are real, literally nutrition centers and pharmacies for animals. Um, we'll talk about plant diversity today. 
And we'll talk about the social cultural part of things. We made the point last week that, um, you know, learning from mothers, starting in utero and early in life, um, what and what not to eat, where and where not to go to forage, becomes vitally important for wild and domestic animals. And we'll uh, make the same points today for we human beings. Last time we also talked at length and showed video about flavor feedback interactions. These, and what the basic idea is simply that our liking for food is mediated by feedback from these primary and secondary compounds. Um, and that mediation occurs at the cellular level. Cells and organ systems, including the microbiome, are feeding back through neurotransmitters and hormones and, and uh, so forth to alter our liking for food as a function of need. Uh, we won't say more about that today. It'll be in the background. We'll emphasize more the, the availability of alternative foods and the social cultural part of things. So that, that's a little bit of an idea of where we're gonna go. Um, and I'll start out by simply pointing out one of your fellow countrymen, Mark Sector, wrote a wonderful book several years ago titled The Dorito Effect, The Surprising New Truth About Food and Flavor. And Mark really captured the essence, I think, of what's happened during the last 50 years or more with the foods that we eat. And he points out the flavors of meat and produce have become blander at the same time that processed foods have become irresistible. And as a result, we've disincentivized real foods because they don't taste good and we've made junk food all the more desirable. So let's go into this, um, this whole idea of why, uh, if you've lived long enough or if you are a gardener and you get in, you're into growing your own foods, maybe um, some of the old varieties of food, of uh, vegetables and fruits that used to have incredible kinds of flavors, or raising your own animals, whether that be chickens or lambs or goats or, or calves um, <clears throat> to eat you can notice big differences in the flavor of those foods versus foods that you might buy at a, at a local grocery store. So let's, let's go into why the flavors of meat and produce have become blander. And uh, we won't say too much about the processed foods other than to reinforce in places that they, they have become all the more resistible. So if you look at fruit and produce, let's start there. Um, it's been well documented by people who study these kind of things that the phytochemical richness, that is to say, not only the nutrients, energy, protein, minerals, but also the, the secondary compounds, that phytochemical richness has declined from 10 to 50 percent in many, many fruits, vegetables, and grains during the last, what, let's say, 70 years now. And as a general statement, what we've done is to enhance growth at the expense of phytochemical richness. So we've put the accent on growing more, bigger, more, and so forth, but it's phytochemical richness has, has declined. And uh, that's a result of three things. One is the varieties that we've selected for. We've selected for growth rather than phytochemical richness. Uh, we also pick fruits green and uh, ripen them uh, uh, during transport, which doesn't do much at all for the flavor or the phytochemical richness of the, of the plant. Also, and we wanna talk a bit more about this, um, when we irrigate and add nutrients, fertilizers, we can oftentimes enhance growth, again, at the expense of phytochemical richness. In fact, um, it's, it's been well documented in the ecological literature that modest amounts of stress in the environment, moisture or nutrient stress, can actually increase concentrations of nutrients, including these uh, secondary compounds in plants. So it's a long-winded way to say that the environment where our plants growing and the varieties that we select for are influencing the phytochemical richness, which in turn then influences the flavor. That probably, and it may have gotten lost last week, hopefully not, but that was a huge 
point of, of the video that we showed where the sheep learn to, to like straw as a function of feedback from nutrients that they were getting when they ate the straw. The reason that at least here in the US, many of these fruits look wonderful, but they have no flavor is because they lack phytochemical richness. Um, flavor, as we were saying last week, is linked with um, feedback from these primary and secondary compounds. And if you don't have that richness, it's gonna look great, but it's not gonna have any flavor. So what Michael and I talked about that we would like to, to discuss here a little bit are the linkages uh, as relates to, um, to this topic. And clearly a major topic nowadays of interest by people is soil health. And we made the point last week that plant diversity, uh, plant is, is really key to the health of soils. It's key to the health of animals key to the health of humans and climate as well. So what I'd like to do is take a few minutes right out front here and talk about plant diversity and what we've done as relates to, uh, to these linkages. But we wanna compare and contrast to a sunlight driven system, which would have been how plants and animals and humans evolved back in the day versus fossil fuel-based system, which has been for the last, what, roughly 100, 100 years or so, that we've really gotten onto a fossil fuel-based as opposed to a sunlight-driven system. So let's start out and talk about that briefly as it relates to these linkages um, amongst plant diversity, animal, human health, climate, and then the link of plant diversity to, to soil health. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of study over the last, what, 50 to 70 years, maybe even, in ecology about how resource availability in the environment, that is to say sunlight, moisture, um, nutrients, influences the kind of plant species that grow in an area and their chemical characteristics. And so, resource availability through plant diversity is influencing the development of soils. It's this resource availability that leads to either really fertile, well-developed soils or harsher places. And uh, the ecologists have been studying those kind of relationships and then how that links in with plant diversity and chemistry. So let's, let's just dive into that for a minute and make some points as it relates to a sunlight-driven system versus a fossil fuel-driven system. Um, during my career uh, over the last 50 years, it's been really interesting to observe two things. One is the studies that plant ecologists have been doing during that time. And then two is the studies that agronomists and people who grow crops and select crops for us have been doing. So let's compare and contrast those two, two worlds. Um, Years ago, I, I mentioned last time I'm thinking, people didn't really understand what roles secondary compounds played in plants, that is these broad grasses of terpenes, alkaloids, phenolics, and so forth. Uh, in fact, way back in the day, they were simply considered waste products of plant metabolism. By the time that I was a young pup starting to learn about this field, they were referred to as secondary compounds, and people were just trying to figure out, well, what roles do they play? During the last 50 years, we've come to realize they're not secondary compounds at all. They play primary roles. They're really the way plants interface with their environment. And for me, at least, it, it was so revelatory 50 years ago, 40 years ago, when I started reading in this literature and understanding, oh my gosh, these compounds, it's amazing all the roles that they're playing. And we've learned much more since then. So, you know, there's compounds in plants that serve as sunscreen. They protect plants from radiation. We talk a lot about antioxidants in human diets. Well, plants are producing other antioxidants to protect themselves from oxygen-free radicals. The colors of plants and the roles those colors play as interfacing with pollinators and fruit eaters that disperse seeds across landscapes. All that's being mediated by these secondary compounds. And then you get into broader effects like these allelopathic effects. That's the way that plants 
produce compounds that prevent other plants from growing around them. And you might think about that as relates to um, natural kind of, of herbicides that, that plants can create. And I understand there's a bit of research going on in that area. Drought resistance, persistence under harsh environmental conditions, secondary compounds are playing key roles in that. They also, and this is the area that, that I got involved in and studied so much, is that they, they can prevent animals from eating them or at least decrease how much of the tissue is removed. Their defenses, in other words, they're also important in regrowth, following grazing and recovery from injuries of one sort or another. So this is just to say that these compounds are playing tremendous number of roles that we weren't aware of, no one was aware of back in the day. So while ecologists were learning of the values of these compounds, other people were reducing their concentration. Well, why would you reduce their concentration? You would reduce their concentrations because there's a cost. There's a cost to the plant in terms of, of energy and nutrients in producing these, these compounds. Nothing comes without a cost. And so if you reduce their concentrations, then the plant can allocate more of its resources to growth rather than to, to these secondary compounds. And so uh, when you select against them, you can certainly increase yields of crops and forages. You can increase energy and protein as opposed to total phytochemical richness in plants. But at the same time, what we didn't understand is that that makes plants more susceptible to environmental hardships. So here's the trade-off. In their stead, we've come to rely on fossil fuel intensive fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides to grow and protect plants and monocultures. Um, you know, originally, as I was saying, plants were producing pesticides, compounds that prevent, uh, whether it's insects, right on through to large herbivores that can either prevent or at least really minimize the, the amount of the plant that these animals eat. Uh, herbicides to control weeds. I was saying that through allelopathy, that's the way that plants do that. They control quote, weeds that would grow around them. Fertilizers to enhance growth. Well, we know that by fixing nitrogen and through root exudates, plants nurture life below ground and through mycorrhizal networks they create, they nurture other plants. So these again are roles that that we didn't appreciate that plants were playing that we're now starting to appreciate. And so that makes, I think, gives an opportunity for everyone to rethink what plants were doing. And then can we, in a way, go back to the way plants were doing things and get out of fossil fuel loops? That's the key point that we're gonna come up. Um, we've also come to rely on antibiotics and antilemetics to treat diseases and parasites in animals. And as we talked last time, you know, when animals have a, a diverse array of plants to select from, high in these um, so-called secondary compounds, that's the way that becomes their anti antibiotics and antilemetics, that is dealing with internal parasites, that's the way that they can do that. And we know that animals from insects to primates use phytochemicals to self-medicate, as we talked about last time, both therapeutically, that is once they're sick, they can learn to utilize plants that can, can alleviate sicknesses. And also by eating little bits of a large number of these plants, they're really medicating themselves prophylactically or preventatively. So what we've done, I think, is to isolate and purify compounds in an attempt to amplify their effects. And certainly there's some times when, when that's important to do, to do just that. But what that's done in the sense that we're talking is made resistance easier for bacteria, insects, and plants. Antibiotic resistance is so well known nowadays that uh, one needn't say much about it. They, these bacteria are constantly uh, evolving and adapting as are viruses like this. We're learning the coronavirus is morphing and morphing and morphing. So we don't have, to, um, it's a moving target. Same thing with insect, um, and, in, and trying to um, deter insects. The pesticides, it doesn't take long to read in the literature and find that these insects are, are be, become resistant to Bt kind of corn and crops and so forth. Uh, there, they learn how to adapt quickly as well. 
And then herbicide resistant plants, I was just looking this week on the website for that, there's well over 500 herbicide resistant plants. So it, it's, it's a good chance then in this broad sense to sit back and have a think about, well, what's going on with natural plant communities? And can we get out of fossil fuel loops and start to work more in a, in a, uh, kind of in an ecological way in the way that plants used to, you know, people are now, and as we've been alluding to trying to genetically engineer back into crops, <clears throat> plant resistance that they originally had. Um, so I got their plants have been playing these games for millions of years. And that's where I think ecology and understanding where plant ecologists have gone and the dynamism of systems and how plants are, are playing these games can be really valuable from an agricultural standpoint. Several years ago, I participated in a symposium titled Farm Ecology, Pharmacological Aspects of Ecology. Wonderful presentations. And I think the most interesting one to me was from a lady who was from the pharmaceutical industry. That's where she spent her career. And she was saying, you know, we need to go back to thinking about how plants have played these games and what roles they've played, just the kind of things that I'm reviewing here, and then have a think about that from the standpoint of, of pharmaceutical industry and what, everything that, uh, that we're up to. It was, it was a very revelatory kind of presentation and uh, just emphasizing points like I'm making, thinking about, well, how, how did plants evolve? What were the roles that these compounds were playing? And rather than selecting against them, can we be um, encouraging programs? And I know of some around the country that are, that are trying to, to um, select for varieties and then growing conditions that, that favor these phytochemical richness for the health of ecological systems. That brings me to a paper that Michael and I have enjoyed discussing and we'll, we'll stop after in just a minute here and then have a chance for discussion, but it's by Higgins. Economics for, for the future beyond the superorganism and many, many points that, that he makes throughout the paper. But a key one related to what we're talking about here is we are utterly dependent on fossil fuels. And he makes the point, this, this paper is published in Ecological Economics. What a beautiful blend of topics. And uh, he does such a wonderful job of pointing out the relationship between eco ecology and economics. And he points out that economics is based on land, labor, and capital without really a wit being mentioned about how all of that over the last hundred years or more has been built upon very, very inexpensive fossil fuels. Well, that's not going to continue the, the, we're, for, for various reasons, not only the availability, which is, going, which is becoming uh, tougher and tougher to get at. We kicked the can down the road with fracking here in the U.S., but we, we didn't get rid of, of the can or the road. That's, it's still in front of us. And then we have issues related to climate change and so forth. So, um, so the challenge is how do we get out of these fossil fuel loops? Some of the folks that I've interacted with down here in the States like Kit Farrow, who talks so much about <clears throat> selecting for locally adapted cattle. That's the key point of the, their whole program is how do we get out of fossil fuel loops get back into natural system loops so we, we are no longer dependent on fossil fuels and that becomes a way to become profitable. Um, when you think about the whole food production system, this is the, the stunning thing. And I'd read it many times before, but Higgins brought it right back to the forefront. To produce one calorie of food energy requires two cal calories of fossil fuels for machinery to plant, irrigate, harvest crops, fertilizers, herbicides, insecticides to grow and protect plants, antibiotics and analytics to maintain the health of livestock. We use another eight to 12 calories to process, package, deliver, store, and cook modern food. In the wild, no species can survive expending 10 to 14 calories to gain one calorie of food energy. It's simply not possible. So um, I think that's, that's the key point and the key issues related to, to this first part of the, the presentation. I wanna build on it, talking, moving away from fruit and vegetables to meat and, uh, and those kind of topics. But Michael, do you wanna break in here and, and sure. say a few words? Mm -hmm. 
Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, um, you went went over a lot there. Um, but yeah, let's talk about um, Hagen's paper here. And uh, I think for me, the important thing that we need to remember here when we we start to talk about. Um, economics and money and environment and people and and you know energy of course um, is that the real especially in agriculture there really is only one form of energy and it is sunlight and even the the oil and gas and coal that we extract is just ancient sunlight right that's been that's been converted from um, solar energy into chemical energy through the miracle of photosynthesis. So kind of knowing that, and, and this is where I think, you know, think that like the regenerative ag principles come into play. And, and, and I think are so important to, you know, a deeper understanding of agriculture and, a, a, you know, and a, a, as part of the process of um, being able to move away from fossil fuels is to, is to keep that green plant growing over the course of a, a growing season. And if you don't have a green plant growing, you are not capturing energy and you are therefore not growing um, either grain or grass or soil, right? Because soil is basically a biological process that is being driven by the conversion of solar energy, CO2 and water into liquid carbon products that are pumped into the ground to feed the biology, to drive that system. The biology then provides mineral to the plant. So the whole thing is interconnected is kind of the point. So that green plant becomes absolutely critical. And as soon as you don't have that green plant, so you think about um, our situation here, and you're kind of the same in Montana is, you know, we're part of the the Northern Great Plains. The, and up here, we call it the prairies, the Canadian prairies is, this used to be a, a vast grasslands, right? Um, grazing animals, many species of plants and animals, and it was perennial. So we were capturing energy, capturing sunlight, probably 200 days a year, even, even in our you know climate where we have winter for many months, we were still capturing sunlight 200 days a year Compare that now where many of those millions of acres now have been converted into cropland, wheat and canola, you know, are our favorites up here and, and uh, their annual, you know, spring seeded. By the time that plant is up, planted May, in middle of May, by the time it's canopied, it's later in June, by middle of August, the plant's starting to senesce. We, we're only capturing sunlight for maybe 50 or 60 days of the year rather than 200. And over time, that has consequences. If you think of the planet like a battery that's being trickle charged by the sun all day, every day. And now that battery is only running at maybe 50% because we have less green plant growing. Um, that, that has consequences. So I think that's basically the short story of how we get off fossil fuels is to understand the ecology and and top of that list is keeping a green plant and a diversity of green plants growing. Amen to everything you said, Michael. I think, and I know that you're you're working closely with with uh, farmers and ranchers throughout your area uh, on regenerative ag and and uh, trying to take take the, those ideas and put them into practice. And I, I think. It's so important for all the reasons that you just went over and that I was making in a general sense right here. Yeah, and maybe to, to back up and, and talk a little bit, uh, I thought of a story when you were talking about uh, plant breeding and some of the consequences of what we've done. And, you know, n none of what we've done has been, has been done with some, you know, evil intent. We had good reasons to do what we, you know, we always need to, sort of preface, but you know, there are trade-offs like you use that. I think that's, that's the perfect word. It, and so for example, I was at a conference um, every year just before Christmas, there's an agronomy conference at the University of Manitoba. That's where I went to school, did a degree in plant science, faculty of agriculture. And, and uh, the one year, it's a few years ago when there was more excitement about soybeans up here, right? They were just coming up to Canada and we were excited to grow soybeans. And 
and the the um, the concern or the the issue was trying to uh, produce a soybean that could that could grow in our climate, right? So they were they were chasing these uh, low heat unit varieties. Plant breeders were, and uh, so there was a group of plant breeders, and and it was just sort of a question answer. And, and one of the questions was, um, well, okay, so you're you're trying to plant breed for um, lower heat units. Um, what's the trade off? And and it was surprising, kind of shocking, is they. All, all these plant breeders agreed that the trade-off was quality. When you, it, it seemed like an unreasonable trade-off, but that, that's what we did. So, you know, I, I think in Manitoba, we're well known for producing a low quality soybean because it's, it's just, it, the soybean is sort of out of context in our environment, right? So we, we're trying yeah. to force it into a, yeah. So that's just a, a story that came to mind is, uh, you know, we. We value yield. That's what we've been valuing because for much of our history, we've been hungry and, you know, constantly trying to scratch out an existence, right? So it would seem correct that the goal should be just to produce more, to feed ourselves. But um, sort of unknowingly, there were, you know, unintended consequences. Right, right. No, and that's a perfect example that you gave in terms of context and then, uh quality. And, you know, I often used to think when we were running all the trials with goats and sheep and cattle, that as quality of what we offered went down, the amount that they ate went up, which makes sense in order to meet their needs for nutrients. If right. they're there in low concentrations, you have to eat more of something that's not good quality. So if you think with that in mind, you know, we focused on yield and not worried so much about quality as people have well documented, as I was saying, at least in fruits and vegetables and in, and in crops. Um, but if we thought in terms of how much does it take to actually meet nutritional needs, then you reach probably a better balance between yield and phytochemical richness of whatever it is that you're growing, total phytochemical richness. And, you know, I, I beat this to death, but, um, you know, it's not just about energy and protein and minerals. These other compounds really were learning so much about the roles they play in human health and animal health, both. And uh, so it's this total mix of, of primary and secondary compounds that really ultimately matters in terms of of our health and the health of the animals in our care. And so it's, you know, it's a big topic and, and it involves many, many people. And as you were saying too, this, what we're saying is not in any way meant to, in some judgmental sense. No, uh, no. You know, I think it's, we just know what we know and disciplines tend to get siloed. And so that's where I was trying to point out at the first year, the ecologists are, are running and gunning, studying all these things, learning about roles of these compounds and agronomists are running and gunning in another direction. And uh, when you put the two fields together, then you start to get a more holistic picture probably of what, what might, you know, and then throw fossil fuels into the loop and you start to think, oh my goodness, you know, um, again, maybe thinking about what was happening in natural systems with, with native plant species that were the ancestors of all, all of these fruits and vegetables and crops uh, is worth to think about that. And then I think in terms of what we grow and how, how we grow that and what it means in terms of costs relative to fossil fuels down the road. Yeah, well, here's a quick, here's a quick question. I uh, just making some notes while you were starting there. And uh, so, you know, I think that one of the, when we talk about phytochemicals, like it's easy for us to make connections, kind of draw straight lines between, you know, energy and protein and fat, uh, you know, to how we value them, right? That that's seems to have been fairly easy, but it, it's become difficult for us to see the connection between, you know, this phytochemical in, in our food that's that, that we need in like parts per billion, you know, parts per trillion. So how do we how do we start to value in the food industry in healthcare 
you know, to consumers that, that these things do have value, you know, economic value as well. Um, so that we can start to, um, you know, orient ourselves to, to focusing on this and, and that it does have um, importance. Uh, that's, that's a super question, Michael. And I, I tell you what, uh, as you were saying that, I was thinking about my own experience with that over the last 50 years of knowing nothing about them to uh, then starting to work with them as I talked last week with the goats and seeing them as defenses against uh, goats eating, eating more nutritious plant parts. Then to coming around to, hey, in small doses, they're really, they're having health benefits for livestock and then reading the literature, the huge literature that's developing on human beings and the value at the cellular level. You know, for instance, cancer, um, uh, that starts at one cell, huh? one apparent cell that, that goes haywire. Uh, well, you know, the way these compounds can help to, to deter, they, they, all the seven hallmarks of, how, of cancer, these compounds can counter those, but it's at a cellular level and it's that cell being able to forage on one of these phytochemicals at the time it needs it that can help keep that cell in check, help, help keep it healthy. So, you know, so there's a rich literature around that, but I, well, you know what popped into my mind is, I think it would be fabulous if one of these good film producers that likes to make these movies on things would make a, would make a really neat documentary that would make that come alive, that would absolutely take that. And I've been visiting with a couple of them recently, actually, but this never crossed my mind to raise that idea that um, of, of the value of these compounds and then the roles that they play in the health of livestock. I mentioned last week that I've been reviewing papers that, uh, and as the literature is developing, as you go from a monoculture to more diverse mixtures of plants, the health of livestock improves. And that it's it's uh, linked with the with these diverse array of secondary compounds. So I think you know it's a really good question that you ask. There's information out there. I think it's how do you get that in a form for um, not only farmers and ranchers, but for the general public. I mean, it took I spent a lifetime working in this. My wife has spent many many years. I remember one time sitting at the breakfast table. And she, she's gotten very much into herbs and herbal medicine. And she, she said, I just love secondary compounds. And I smiled, <laughs> we laughed because she, but you know, I mean, it's, she spent years reading and reading and working and be, making that a part of our, of our life. And uh, so it, you ask a perfect question, Michael. And that, that's what comes to mind to me is, and I think I'm gonna I'm gonna send a note to a couple of these guys that that have done some really nice, really nice uh, movies about about landscapes and regenerative kind of agriculture, and ask them if they'd ever be interested in trying to take that on as a topic and make that come alive for people. Yeah, well, there there may be a moment here where these ideas are, um, you know, maybe twenty years ago these ideas there was. It wasn't the right time, but I think the, these ideas resonate now, um, and I think we're ready to um, hear some of you know the more the complexity of how uh, of how these systems work and the and the value of some of these uh, like phytochemicals and so on. So yeah, I think there there's a moment here where we can take advantage of that, and and then you can start to orient producers to 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 look seriously at that because we can start to reward them um, for growing higher quality, you know, food and fiber. And, and if they're rewarded for that, they'll, they'll start to, you know, look seriously at, at producing it. Whereas right now they've been, they, you know, they're oriented to just grow yield because that's what pays. Absolutely the case, you know, and I'm thinking of one of these, uh filmmakers that I talked with for a couple of hours last week and he was making the point that that his what he does is is aimed at the consumer um, he has an amazing farm himself he and his wife and many people working with them but 
the movies are are aimed at the consumer and for good reason if you get the consumer to think this is valuable and to willing to to pay for for these kinds of things then that's the incentive for for the the farmers and the ranchers to to uh to produce what what the consumer wants so uh r really really good point and uh All right, we can, I think we've uh, Move discussed on, huh? that. Well, yeah, let's, uh, okay, let's no, continue. It's, it's important. And but you know, you. how do you make something become real? That That's really the thing. Yep. And it, for me, it took many, many years of, of working in this area to, to see the value. And now what we do, uh, we grow herbal, medicinal, vegetable gardens here at, at our home, at our place, because we value that. We value, we, and we don't go to the doctor. And we think it's it's because we, you know, the foods we eat and the lifestyle we, we keep, we, we avoid the doctors at all costs. And our doctor tells us to avoid them at all costs. And so, you know, how you get out of these loops for you, for the animals in your care, how, how you, uh, it's, it's about these kind of issues. And let's move into that. Um, we're, so we're talking about this idea that resource availability in the environment, that is sunlight, moisture, and nutrients in, in, uh, in natural systems, that influences plant diversity and the chemistry of the plants. And what we want to say next is that influences the biochemical richness of the diets of livestock, um, which influences the quality of milk, cheese, and, and meat. We wrote a paper a couple of years ago titled, Is Grass-Fed Meat and Dairy Better for Human and Environmental Health? We've since published two more papers that have just come out on that. And I mentioned that because we're happy to share those if people want them, but they're all uh, really burrowing into this topic of these linkages from um, uh, resource availability through diversity and chemistry and so forth. So let's take just a minute to talk about uh, meat and dairy, or about milk and dairy, and then talk about meat as relates to these linkages. You know, there's been a fair amount of work, I would say, not a, not a huge amount, but, but some work that's been done to look at how the diets that animals are eating influences the quality of milk and cheese for human consumption. I think the most interesting and powerful one, one of them to me, was done over in Italy, and they fed dairy cows either a total mixed ration or they allowed them to graze on these really diverse landscapes. And then they looked at uh, using techniques back in the day, they looked at what's the uh, phytochemical and biochemical richness of the milk and dairy products um, for TMR versus uh, grass, these diverse plant communities. And there was, there are striking, striking differences as one would expect that the cows that are out there foraging on diverse arrays of plants have, have milk and cheese that's much, much richer in terms of its chemistry. And that richness of chemistry translates into the flavor, the, a much greater, richer flavor of milk and cheese. And when they did preference tests of of the dairy products, of the cheese and so forth, local people strongly prefer the flavor of milk and cheese from cows grazing on botanically diverse swords. So those linkages, and I think for anyone who's been on a farm or a ranch and had a, had a dairy cow or more dairy cows, when I was on the ranch in Colorado, we had a dairy cow. We'd milk her and then uh, make ricotta cheese from it. But depending which pasture she was on, that really influenced the flavor of, of her milk. And so people who have done that, you, you know that. And I was in Ireland a couple of years ago, well, a few years ago now, and uh, there was a guy giving a, a tour of a place. And it was so interesting. Before the tour began, he was, he was talking about this, this topic. And an old lady who had lived in the town, rich, wealthy people that owned, owned really big farm. And he said, when, when people were coming to, the, to visit them that they really wanted to impress, they made sure that the dairy cow was, was on pasture X, this pasture over here as opposed to another pasture. 
And he understood without knowing a thing about what I'm talking about here, they, he understood that forages and animals eating are going to influence the flavor of the milk and the cheese. So that's, you know, that's one point. Um, we can move to meat and there's less known, honestly, and I'm going to make a point of this, but um, anyone who's, who's a hunter in the group, I hunted for most of, most of my, my life, loved to hunt. And you know that um, <clears throat> the, the place where you shoot an animal, what it's been foraging on is going to really influence the flavor of the meat. And that's for all creatures, not just for say deer or elk or bison, but for grouse as well. I think often of grouse, you know, early in the fall, they're eating this rich array of different plant species. Their meat has one particular flavor, one richness of flavor. To get into the late fall where, where I used to hunt, the birds move into these Douglas fir trees and they start to eat the needles of the Douglas fir tree. Meat totally takes on a, a different flavor. That's terpenes, the, these needles of Douglas fir trees are high in terpenes. And the meat takes on this very subtle hint of terpene. It was actually uh, really quite a fabulous flavor, but there was no question that their diet had switched. Now in Life in the Rocky Mountains, Warren Angus Ferris is talking about these sort of things. Now he was out west from 1830 to 1835. And he makes a point, bison in poor flesh were the worst diet imaginable, but as they became fat, quote, we grew strong and hearty and now not one of us, but is ready to insist that no other kind of meat can compare with that of a female bison in good condition. So, you know, the diets that those bison are eating are influencing the flavor and uh, phytochemical and biochemical characteristics of the meat. He goes on to say, with it, we require no seasoning. We boil, roast, or fry it as we please and live upon it solely without bread or vegetables of any kind. And what seems most singular, we never tile up, tire of or disrelish it, which would be the case with almost any other meat after living up on it exclusively for a few days. You know, that's an amazing statement if you think about it. Have you ever tried to eat just one food day after day after day? Um, we used to run studies where we would look at how quickly animals got sick and tired of eating the same old food. And what we tried to do, what we looked at was if the more adequate we could make the diet relative to the needs of the animals, that was a question we were asking, would they stick with that food more for a longer period? If on the other hand, we made the food either deficient in nutrients the animal needed or excessive in nutrients the animal needed, what would happen? And we found that the, the, the more we could match their needs, the longer they would stick with it, but they still satiated. They still got tired of eating the same old food. So what Ferris is saying here is pretty amazing uh, to think about. And that's something uh, my colleagues and I, Stefan Van Vliet at uh, Duke and Scott Kronberg at Mandan are really interested in. So, um, we know very little actually about how the phytochemical richness of the diet affects meat flavor, quality, satiety. That's what Ferris was talking about. They didn't say she, they didn't get sick and tired of, of eating that meat and human health. So what we're doing is comparing fake meat, um, whether we, we started with plant-based meat alternatives, we're comparing that with meat from feedlots, and with meat from animals that are eating these phytochemically rich diets. So we're really interested in this question of, um, you know, how does the diet of animal not only affect the health of the animal, but um, the value for humans. And we're doing different kinds of trials. One, just to look at the phytochemical richness, there's a way, an approach called metabolomics, and it's, it's simply a way, don't need to go into any details, it's simply a way to look at the total phytochemical and biochemical richness of, of meat. You can get this, this broad idea of what's, what's happening, much broader than simply focusing, for instance, on omega-3 versus omega-6 or any of the fatty acids or CLA or minerals or whatever you want. This is simply a way to, to get this, uh, to look at, at, at the richness of these compounds. 
So that's one approach that we're taking. We're also doing feeding trials for inflammation. I'm gonna say a bit more about that in just a minute here, what that means. And then we're doing longer term clinical trials to look at how well do these different kinds of meats satiate a human, cause you to, you know, do you eat less actually, as we were talking, if you have a meat like Warren Angus Ferris is talking about, that's really meeting to your needs, do you end up eating less of that because it is meeting needs and how that uh, meat affects inflammation and health and so forth. So we're, we're really taking a broad approach and we're looking at a variety of different animal species from sheep here in the US and New Zealand to cattle in the US to bison uh, that uh, are here in the US as well. So we're looking across a variety of species and diets. Um, realize when it comes to this metabolomics kind of analyses um, that our understanding of how diet affects health is limited to about 150 nutritional components. And that may sound like, wow, that's a lot. Um, but you know, that's, those compounds are a small fraction of the tens of thousands of biochemicals in the human food, food oil. Um, meat can have over 45,000 different kinds of compounds depending upon the diet that the animals are eating. So then you think of meat and then you think of all these fruits and vegetables and you understand it's incredibly, incredibly complex. And this feedback that we were talking about last week and these linkages, um, it's overwhelming to, to, from a reduction of science standpoint to even think how you can start to address that if you wanna look one compound or a handful of compounds at a time. And what we're learning too, is that it's, it's, it's the, the tremendous complexity and diversity of compounds as a whole that's affecting health. I, I was in uh, Austria a year ago and uh, participating in a conference and I heard a fabulous, fabulous talk by, by a guy who spent his lifetime studying these kinds of things. And, uh, you know, the point was, the more you focus on one individual compound, the less relevant it is to anything. It's this complex whole, and it's this complex whole that the body is integrating. And that's why we don't want to simply do metabolomic analyses. We want to get into these feeding trials and clinical trials where we let the human body which is the master of this, integrate all of this kind of information. So, you know, here's just a little bit of an example. Some of the primary compounds in spinach, some of the secondary compounds that are in oregano. Um, and it, this, is, this isn't all, all of them. So it gives you an idea of the complexity. So when we do these metabolomic analyses, just as a for instance, and we compare beef from, um, animals that are eating a really phytochemically rich diet, and we compare that with soy-based meat alternatives or pea-based meat alternatives, when you look at, at, at some of the broad categories, um, energy and protein and so forth, they match up pretty well. But when you look at the total phytochemical and biochemical richness, ground beef is, the, the meat that's coming from the phytochemically rich diet is hands down much, much richer than that from the plant-based alternative. So that's um, what we're finding when we do the metabolomic analyses, and we've published a paper on that. Moving beyond um, the metabolomic kind of work, uh, which can reveal differences in richness, to the feeding trials, let me say a few words about, about that next. And What's amazing to me is how little research has been done on this topic. You know, the studies that are really critical of eating red meat or processed meat are primarily epidemiological studies. And, um, you know, the, those studies, without going into too much detail, they're simply associations. That, uh, they don't prove any kind of causation between what's being eaten and not. And and they end up being not so robust, actually, in terms of the, their implications for our health. Uh, there was a study came out a year or so ago that strongly, strongly criticized them based on the lack of really rigorous data. It, it was a quite, quite a good series of papers. But so what's lacking are 
feeding trials with humans, clinical trials with humans that really look at indications of health when people are eating red meat or processed meat under different kinds of conditions. Now, the study I want to talk about here was done in Australia. And what they did in Australia, when you go to the stores there, you can buy not only lamb and beef, but you can buy kangaroo. It's common to be able to any of those products. And what they wanted to do was to compare Wagyu cattle that had been finished on a total mixed ration in a feedlot with meat from kangaroos that were foraging on diverse landscapes there in Australia. And they were looking at inflammatory responses, measuring these inflammatory markers. I'll say a bit more about inflammation here in a minute, but inflammation is what's linked with all these diseases. Chronic uh, inflammation is, is linked with so many ailments in humans nowadays. So they were wanting to get an idea. Is there a difference in inflammation with one meat versus the other? And what they found was that the postprandial, that is say after a meal, when you look at inflammatory markers, they were much higher when people were eating meat from the Wagyu cattle versus meat from the kangaroo. They increased very rapidly and they, may, and they were high for a long period of time. Now, um, what you, what's important to realize is that anytime we eat a meal, there's an inflammatory response in our body. The degree to which that occurs depends upon what we're eating. And so if you're eating food that doesn't cause much of a response as your diet day in, day out, your likelihood of having health-related issues goes down compared to if day in, day out, the, the dietary habits lead to, to inflammation in your body. Um, so this low-grade systemic inflammation leads to these different metabolic diseases. And as I was saying, notably, inflammation occurs within a meal with increasing likelihood of developing diseases when meals that elevate inflammation become dietary habits. Um, so the recommendation then is to moderate inflammation by eating wholesome diets that prevent or treat metabolic diseases. Um, We'll talk more about that here in just a minute, but that, that's, that's kind of the key thing that, the, that they were looking at. You know, herbs and spices um, can, counter, can counter the effects of inflammation. Herbs and spices added to foods enhance palatability, satiation, and satiety, and they reduce alleged adverse effects of eating red meat. These inflammatory responses that people see with meat from feedlot animals can be mitigated with by adding herbs and spices. Uh, I think it's interesting to note that Native Americans made pemmican from meat and wild berries. And, you know, the combination of the meats they were eating plus the berries, uh, one could argue reduce alleged adverse effects of eating red meat if, if there are, in fact, uh, effects depending on the meat you eat. Uh, in Morocco, there was a study published just, just a year or so ago, and what they were showing is eating traditionally processed meat is not associated with increased risk of cancer in Morocco. One of the reasons they were arguing that is the case is that um, what Katie did, for instance, ribs of beef, lamb, or camel cut into thin slices, mixed with olive oil, herbs, spices, such as cumin, garlic, coriander, salt, and vinegar. And they are arguing that this rich array of herbs is, uh, is mitigating that, those kind of effects. And we would argue through reducing inflammation. And the broader idea then tying back to what we were talking about on um, uh, livestock that are fed a total mixed ration in the feedlot versus livestock that are um, livestock that, that would be on phytochemically rich diets we would argue those phytochemicals get into the meat and into the fat and they can, they can reduce in inflammation. So this is an area that, that we're quite interested in, in pursuing research-wise and actively involved in nowadays. So I'd sum up by, by making the point that uh, rather than grow and eat wholesome blends of phytochemically and biochemically rich foods, at least here in the US with our issues related to obesity and diet related diseases, 
uh, we've succumbed to the allure of multi-million dollar supplement in industries that claim to be the foundations of health. And that's built a lot on um, highly processed foods. And then we, the supplement industry in this country is uh, enormous, enormous. And the point that I would make is that <clears throat> when you go from combinations of foods, of wholesome foods to individual foods, to individual compounds, the ability of that diet to promote health diminishes greatly. Um, when you, for instance, buy a garlic capsule, it has a small fraction of the phytochemical richness of a garlic clove. And that garlic clove has, <clears throat> again, a small fraction, even though it's quite rich, of the diverse array of compounds that you would get from eating wholesome cone in the ways we were talking about. Um, the global shift away from eating phytochemically and biochemically wholesome foods to ultra processed diets that are really high in refined carbohydrates um, has, has, I think there's, it's encouraged many, many 2.1 billion people to eat processed foods and become overweight or obese. Um, these processed foods do little to induce satiation or satiety so people overeat and gain weight. And that was illustrated really nicely in a study that compared ultra processed diets with unprocessed diets. And these diets were presented in random order to the people in the study and matched for um, <clears throat> calories, sugar, fat, fiber, and macronutrients. So what they found was that when they looked at ad libitum intake, people simply ate much more of the ultra processed than the unprocessed foods. The unprocessed are, are satiating, not only through the nutrients they're providing, but through the fullness effect, just from, from uh, the sense receptors in the gastrointestinal tract. Body weight change, and if any of you have ever tried this, you, you, you can do it yourself. When you start eating ultra-processed foods, if you run the experiment and you just eat that day after day after day, and you weigh yourself each day, you'll see that your weight is going up, up, up. And that's exactly what they found on this study. People on the unprocessed diet uh, were, were losing weight uh, compared to the processed diet. So to sum up and to, to wrap up this part, I, I would say that what we've done from an ultra processed standpoint, we've extracted the compound from the food, the food from the diet and the diet from the culture, which is what we wanna talk about uh, as the next topic. And we end up having little notion of how meal patterns or combinations of foods influence nutrition and health. So with that, Michael, that's, that's uh, kind of hitting some points then on, on this, let food be our medicine and the availability of alternative foods and how we grow those foods and then how that influences the phytochemical and biochemical richness of uh, fruits, vegetables, meats that, that we eat. And going back to Mark's point, um, the flavors of the foods we eat have become blander. And that's by way of trying to provide some explanation for why that's happened. Yeah, that's great. Um, maybe just a quick comment on inflammation. I think that's become a, a big topic of conversation and, and maybe, you know, one of the larger issues in in medicine that we haven't really discussed much until very recently that, and, and this notion of um, sort of chronic inflammation versus, you know, acute inflammation, what you were talking about, like that there is an inflammatory response after a meal and that there's nothing wrong with that. You know, inflammation is part of the healing process or any number of things, but when it becomes chronic and ongoing day after day after day after, that's when you get into these issues like you know like you mentioned you got a list there things like colitis and so on these autoimmune disorders that tend to appear because of chronic chronic ongoing inflammation and um, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned that one of the issues may be that um, herbs are are part of that um, you know complex system that 
that may um, deal with inflammation. And you know, when most of us, you know, here in Western culture, we we sort of think of herbs as simply, um, you know, something that adds a bit of flavor to our food, but it, it may be much more than that. There, there, there may be many things going on in those, you know, low level phyto, phytochemicals that are, that are beneficial. Yes, that links back to your good question at the end of the last session, section, subsection there too. Um, you know, phytochemicals and how, you know, how can we get people to value them? There have been some nice review papers written. One, one of the best I read years ago was titled Food, Not Nutrient is the Basic Unit in Nutrition. And they were really making that point that it's this broad combination of compounds. And then they followed that up, one of the authors, with a wonderful paper on herbs and spices. And, you know, you, you hit on it really good. You say we, we think of them as adding flavor and making foods more flavorful. And they, they are. And if you think to last week now and think that flavor, flavor is linked with feedback and we're liking that because that feedback cells and organ systems are sending us messages saying this is good. And there's a re really some neat studies, not a, not a big body of literature on it, but in the, in, from humans that if you take a food, a base food, chili is one I'm thinking of, and then you add rich arrays of spices to that, people not only like it better, but they satiate more quickly on it. They don't need to eat as much to reach a satisfied level. So, you know, again, it's just making this point that these herbs and spices aren't trivial. Growing your own herbs and spices and making really rich ones uh, or buying them, how, however, but, you know, they're, they're not they're not trivial in terms of, of health. And I think that's where, when, when animals are eating on this rich array of herbs and spices out in the pasture, that's influencing meat and dairy and the flavor of that for, for human consumption. So th those really, um, those things to me really become linked one with another. Sure, absolutely. And when you mention that that flavor feedback mechanism, it 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 makes me think that you know we figured out how to hijack that system. You know we we've we've figured it out, but now we've hijacked it in the sense that you know processed food is um, kind of overwhelming that that system. It's a you know un unnaturally high levels of energy and protein and fat and salt that just they're they're they're, they're so compelling for us because they, they, um, they feed into that and, and overwhelm that mechanism that uh, we, we just can't resist uh, these. Uh, I, think, I think about myself when I, the odd time where I, I still have say like a, something from a fast food restaurant and, and there, there is something different about that experience than, than sort of your, the, the typical meal that you have sitting at home at the, at the dining room table. That's absolutely the case. I'm happy you're making the, the points. And Mark really nailed it in the, in the Dorito effect. There's no question. He, and he, he goes into the flavor industry and, and this flavor feedback too. And that's, you know, I mean, there's nothing left to chance when it comes to, it's such big money uh the food industry for humans is is enormous and they they understand these principles and processes we're talking about inside and out and so and mark gets into that in nice ways in in the dorito effect and like we talked about i put in one slide last time that <clears throat> after we showed those sheep that that had been uh eaten the straw and then and then given uh dosed with 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 energy, with with uh, with up energy right into the gut. Now that's what the food industry's figured out how to do is to is to make some really enticing flavors, and then you follow that with a blast of refined carbohydrates, which gives you immediate feedback from energy, and uh, and we can't resist it. It's like you say, and that's where the system uh, ultimately gets gets hijacked. No question about it. And I appreciate you, you know, kind of remaking those points. For me, you've been thinking about it for 40 years now, 45 years, and it's become so real to me. Um, 
in in the sense, but I, I think it's it's so worth trying to come back to the points and, and link them link them with last week and and just keep hitting on those points. The the relationship between flavor and feedback, nutritional quality, the flavor of meat and produce have become blander. At the same time, processed foods have become irresistible. So we disincentivize real foods because they don't taste good, made junk food all the more desirable. The challenge for us now is to grow wholesome fruits, vegetables, meats that have wonderful flavor so that we disincentivize the processed foods and make wholesome foods all the more desirable, right? That's where, that's where we need to go now. And it gets linked in with all these things that, that we've been, been talking about as we've gone through this section, including you know, the, the fossil fuel linkages and uh, yeah, the whole, the whole business huh? gets, gets linked up in that sense, right on through to our health, the health of our animals, uh, the roles that herbs and spices directly or through the what the animals eat, how that comes to influence us and uh, and so forth. For myself, I, I find it um, very hopeful. You know, it's, it's a big challenge, but we now have the understanding that we can we can make progress on on these uh, on these issues and. That that to me is the the hopeful part, and and the work that you've done over the past 40, 50 years is uh, is a big part of that. It's suddenly becoming, I think, you know, super relevant in a, in a way that it it may not have been when when you published that research, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. The no, time it's has come, true, and it, yeah. it's as you said, Michael, the kind of a time and a place for everything. And yep. uh, you're right, you know. 20, 30, 40 years ago when we we and many other people were starting to learn about these things, you just kind of take it on board and and uh, maybe don't even yourself really fully understand what, where it might lead or what it might mean. But it, it I think it its relevance is um, certainly we can understand its relevance more now than we could then, huh? That to see, see the roles kind of Hindsight's 2020, huh? And you start to put put things together and think about them and and have a lot of aha moments. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's probably a good place to end today's uh, webinar. Yeah, we sure can, Michael. And then what we can do is, uh, I think so too. Let let's do. There's and you can end it. You know, I, I'll just tell. Yep. What we could do next time, Michael, is take off on this social cultural part, okay. and uh, and let's run through. We'll run through that. Um, 